Um, can I be heard? Thanks, sir. Um, well, I, I, I don't consider the uh, New Yorker to be one of the most prestigious magazines in America or the world. It is the greatest magazine in the world. <laughs> it's, it's what got me interested in magazines. And I've been a New Yorker nut uh, <laughs> since high school. I've read all the biographies of Harold Ross and um, William Shawn. There's not one of Robert Gottlieb yet. Um, it's a great Paris Review interview with Robert Gottlieb. Oh, that's Gottlieb. right. Fantastic. Right. Okay, really interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, but the, the, <coughs> the reason um, people fall in love with The New Yorker is that it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in this um, der derided culture that we have that a weekly magazine would come out with, uh, with accuracy, uh, uh, literariness, truthfulness, and an honorable intention. And I, and I think in the end, that's what uh, distinguishes the New Yorker from uh, the riffraff is the, the motivation, if, if they screw up um, once or twice a year or whatever it is, I don't know, it doesn't matter because their intentions are to be honorable. And even an honorable human being will screw up. So th the fact that, that this magazine exists in which their, their fact-checking department is, is 20 people, I think they have 20 people there mm. to ensure that Everything they publish is as accurate as they th they think it th they think it is, and um, m that doesn't happen anywhere else. I mean, book publishers have twenty people in their in their marketing and PR <coughs> departments, and zero people in their fact checking department. And th these are the principles that that make this magazine great. Uh, on top of that, you need the, you need individuals of excellence to. Um, Continue and expand on the the um, the, the Harold Ross impetus. Um, Ross once said that um, he once hired a writer who was shocked by what he. Uh, Harold Ross was the founder of the New Yorker. The New Yorker came out in 1925 for the first time, and he hired a writer named Morris Mackey, who we don't remember <laughs> anymore. Morris and, Mackey. And Mackey was shocked by his job interview with Harold Ross because Ross <coughs> told him that his job was to be honest at whatever cost. That was, his, that, that was how he was hired. And, this, uh, and later on, uh, uh, Harold Ross wrote a, a, a note to, his, to the owner, uh, Ralph Fleshman, and said that uh, in the midst of this, uh, some argument, he said, we have an opportunity to live honestly. And these New Yorker fools believe in these principles, <laughs> and they act on them, and they are uh, an inspiration to people who read carefully. Um, and so, and, and then they've had five editors, and Mr. Remnick is number five, and he's got his own style, and he's expanding the excellence of the magazine, and I am uh, entranced and enchanted by. Uh, what he's doing there, and I could go on and on about my. I wish you would. That's yeah. why I flew down from Arkansas. <laughs> I, 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 to take off closing day and hear you talk about the New Yorker is actually a great privilege. And I, I, I and, and in all seriousness, I want to um, return the compliment. I, uh, I've been reading your magazine for a long time, and it's a total, total joy. And so it's a privilege to be here. Well, that's not why I said that. That's all right. <laughs> It's all right. But I'll, but I'll tell you, any, any honest editor w will, will can tell you that the, the endless ways in which the New Yorker trumps his or her magazine. And I'm just going to give one quick story, and then we'll get into the interview. Um, I, went to I, I see no reason for the interview. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now you know how it feels to uh, work at the Oxford American. Yeah. Just, uh, it works for you. So I went down to Oxford, Mississippi, very excited, and I was going to impress the locals there. Um, locals, I didn't say yokels, locals. <laughs> um, because I'd written this um, uh, editorial 
about my little uh, fake crush, um, Joey Lauren Adams, uh, the, the actress. And uh, I've, I've written a little editorial, <laughs> and, and she was in, it was about her, or about something she said. And I was going to go in there into the uh, uh, famous bar, um, City Grocery, and, uh, and meet her there with the, the, um, the hoity-toity of, 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 of Oxford and say, here's my new magazine, and read the editorial and just kind of <sighs> relax in, in, in while they were reading. So I go up there, and it's crowded in City Grocery, and I'm coming there with the magazine about Joey Lauren Adams, and she's there with her um, uh, highfalutin friends, and I go up there, and they are reading a copy of the New Yorker in which Rodney Jones, the poet, had written about Joey Lauren Adams. <laughs> so there is no way, I mean, every opportunity. You gotta be quick. Yeah. <laughs> Later on during this night, uh, I kid you not, um, the New Yorker, uh, Cover uh, the New Yorker copy was uh, it was one of those little bar uh, stool tables, circular ones. It was on the top, and people were still talking about it. And the the, the copy of the uh, Oxford American that I'd given to Joey Lauren uh, <laughs> had eventually made it w its way down to uh, her. Uh, she was sitting on it. <laughs> and David. Well, that's uh, a start. Yeah, and David. I, I think I finally trumped you. <laughs> um, all right, so um, th this is a, a complete uh, uh, honor and thrill for me. Um, um, I'm one of those um, lucky people who, who, who's reading, whose experience with the New Yorker helped give him direction in life. Um, if you <coughs> read the New Yorker early in life, you might think differently and move differently. That's possible. I, I personally experienced it. I don't know if anybody else did, but I did. What did, you, what did you read early that you thought did that for you? It was actually, I think, Paul and Kale, because um, okay. I had never, I mean, the idea that somebody could be profound and... And profane uh, at the same time. And <laughs> profound and profane and, 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 and intelligent about something I knew about as yeah. a teenager, movies. Yeah. Uh, I only hold one thing against Pauline is that she liked Yentl better than she liked Shoah. But <laughs> that's true. It's okay. That's very true. Yeah. But she um, was she was an extraordinary. Well, writer. she was true to herself. Yeah, that's true. Um, before becoming, <clears throat> before becoming, I have to find a, a new voice for the question. So, uh, before becoming editor of the New Yorker, <laughs> the only editing job you ever had. Was that your high school newspaper? This is true. This is sadly true. I, I became the editor of the New Yorker. Uh, I was about I was thirty nine, and before that, I had never edited anything except uh, the high school newspaper. I went to a high school called Pascack Valley, and our mascot was the Indians, which is um, you know falling out of fashion as it should from uh, mascothood, uh, although Atlanta clings to it as if to a tomahawk. And, um, <laughs> and I wrote the whole newspaper and edited the whole newspaper myself. And because no one else in my high school was interested in, wow. by the way, the newspaper was called very cleverly, The Smoke Signal. <laughs> I hope you can get the connection. <laughs> Indian smoke signal communication. And the only other time I saw somebody do this is I went um, in, in New York, uh, I went to do a piece about ethnic newspapers. Chinese newspaper, and they sell tremendous amounts, some of them more than the Daily News. And I went to the uh, Yiddish Daily Forward, which was at, at the time of you know, immigration, when my grandparents came to New York, which was a very big deal. It was the enculturating institution uh, of Jews coming from Russia and Poland to the Lower East Side, you know, right to the pickle barrel. And, um, and so I went up there, and there was a new English language edition. It was very exciting. They were publishing people like Philip Gurevich and Jeff Goldberg, and a lot of people who eventually came to guess what, The New Yorker. And, and then I went to the Yiddish side, as if to the other side of a, the aisle, and there was really one guy. And he was writing up with six pseudonyms <laughs> and putting together the whole thing because the language was dying. Right. Um, so I felt very kin to him in some way. But you're absolutely right. I came to this job. 
The New York Times is like an, is an institution. It's like the State Department or a big university or something like that. And people who become the editor climb up a certain ladder. And in the new editor's case, Jill Abramson, it's considered an incredible aberration that she was never a foreign correspondent. Right. Not that, she was, that, that she's a first woman, but that she's never a foreign right. correspondent. That's, how, that's an aberration. For me, I'd never edited anything <laughs> before taking over this magazine that you so extraordinarily described. And it was a little bit um, unnerving. Well, my, qu my question actually is, is are, are, were there any similarities between the two gigs, the two editing gigs, <laughs> high school and, and New Yorker? Not one. Not one. <laughs> Not one. I, I edited the high school newspaper. At, it, there used to be something in American life called a bridge table. And my parents had a bridge table. I, they didn't play bridge, but they had the table. <laughs> and um, I did it all with glue and, 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 and rubber cement and lines to make the yeah. columns and so on. And if you know anything about modern technology, which I know you do, Mark, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> and and uh, so I, but look, Tina Brown had hired a, a number of extraordinary reporters. And you know the staff had accreted some extraordinary people. I mean, to edit a magazine and say yes to John Updike is not a stroke of genius. <laughs> now, that's not the only thing involved. Right. But there were already people in place to say yes to that, at, um, and to work with that, um, well, as unnerving as it was, as preposterous, and let me just say, as preposterous right, as it was, right. it, it made that possible. I learned. Well, OK. So but before that, uh, you had a 10-year stint at the Washington Post. That's right. Um, you began in 1982 as a crime reporter on the night beat. Yeah, it was really bad crime reporter. Well, well, wait. Yeah. Um, uh, the 80s were a dramatic period for, for crime, actually. Yeah, it, it, was, it, was the, it was the thick of the um, uh, crack cocaine period in So uh, I, I want to know about in Washington. What, what memories um, stick out um, from that period as a crime reporter? Because did you read Edna Buchanan? Bu I did. Edna Buchanan was the great police reporter for the Miami Herald and m made famous by, if you weren't a Miamian, uh, made famous by Bud Trillin, Calvin Trillin's profile of her right. in The New Yorker. And Trillin decided that in all the great leads, lead paragraphs that Edna Buchanan had written, the best one was a story about a guy who got shot online at a McDonald's. And the, and the, and the lead was, uh, Joe Smith died hungry, period, paragraph. <laughs> OK. I was not Edna Buchanan. I was what's called a night police reporter. So you, a night police reporter in a newspaper, uh, newspapers are these things that used to come out on paper every day. <laughs> and people bought them and read them in the fantastic numbers. And they were healthy businesses <laughs> when I started. And, and, and I, was a news, I was a night police reporter, which is the, it wasn't the lowest rung on the to totem pole. It was underground. And my job was to come in at 6 o'clock in the morning and start making phone calls to all the various hospitals and police shacks around the, the Virginia, Washington, and DC area and ask the following question. Hi, I, uh, it's David Remnick over here at the Post. Do you have any crimes, fires, or accidents that I should know about? <laughs> it was like being Dracula. <laughs> and if there, a sufficient amount of blood had been spilled or mayhem had occurred, you would then get in a car and drive out to it, at which point the police wouldn't talk to you. So uh, you, it was, I wasn't very good at it. People, people are very good at it. And they make careers of it, and they break stories, and you, know, you see them in The Wire. Or something. There are people that are great at it. I wasn't all that hot at it. And the, uh, the sports department had an opening. And I quickly, quickly, quickly was, uh, I was asked, do you know anything about sports? You know, I grew up in America, so the answer is yes, um, which is to say I watched things on Sunday or at, at night. And I, so I immediately became the um, second string boxing, uh, third string basketball, and the lead writer about a new football league called the United States Football League, which played in the summer. And I covered a team called the Washington Federals. And I'm pretty much the only person, other than the players, who saw all the games. <laughs> that was the exalted beginning. But, but here, here, here's the thing. Uh, you know, um, uh, Harold Ross and H.L. Mencken both had dreams to um, start a literary crime magazine. Right. Um, so uh, 
I just want to know. I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I want to know if there were any memories from your crime reporting period that just stick with you. Well, as I say, it, it was it was the crack uh, period, and crack leached into politics, and eventually I wrote about um, Marion Barry, and uh, which was a really sad and outrageous right. story. But you know, I, other than seeing dead bodies in the street one after another, really? almost completely African American males between the ages of 13 and 26, one after the other, night after night. And coming back, and it was so prevalent, uh, it was so prevalent that these stories um, were one paragraph. Right. And I remember the first night I came in, I thought, oh, this is horrible. Somebody shot somebody over crack. And da, da, da. The guy said, one paragraph, slug it, slay. As if I were in a Clark Gable movie, moved to the right. early 80s. Um, so it was the accumulation of, um, of carnage night after night. But again, I didn't get very far. It was six months. I would, to, to get other stories in the paper, I'd come in earlier. And th in those days, I did work 18 hours a day. I, I didn't so much live at the Washington, I didn't live in Washington, I lived at the Washington Post. And I learned to report. I didn't know anything. Um, and, and reporting uh, meant asking constant, rude uh, questions of strangers. And including bereaved mothers and fathers, and can I have that picture there? And all the things that you saw in episode five of The Wired and uh, some of the other very few decent representations of how journalism in its real working life exists. I, I do think, by the way, writing about crime, true crime stories, this is a genre, especially as it became a literary genre, that I find um, has painted itself into a corner. That I, I you know, it, it is kind of before and after in Cold Blood. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that there's a sameness to a lot of true crime sure. writing and that the innovations after 1965 in that particular genre are pretty rare. You're right. Well, that's why you skip over it. And by the way, William Sean hated in Cold Blood. Yeah, I know. William Sean um, notoriously um, uh, worried about things that were gross in right. a family magazine, thought that Truman Capote was going to go to Kansas. What's the name of the town in Kansas? We'll remember. It starts with Holcomb. And in the wake of this murder, was going to write a piece about almost sociological or, or, or psychological about the effect of the crime, right. the murder of the Clutter family on the town, right. which of course he d did not do. That right. he did something much more uh, uh, lurid, right. uh, and it became probably the signature piece of Sean's time, or one of three or four, right. Right. and he hated it. Right. He didn't hate. He, it made him ill at ease. But he still published it. He did still publish it. I think, he, he, you know, it, it, um, there was no question he was going to publish it. That, that piece was so popular. In Cold Blood came out in four parts in, in, in The New Yorker in 1965. And people would run after the trucks, practically, yeah. to get the yeah. copies. It was an enormously yeah. important uh, piece, every bit as much as Hiroshima in, in, in its way. Would you please tell us about your first experience in The New Yorker via the hips? Kimball ah, line, ah, I, uh, and what uh, kind of effect, okay. if any, Google is a terrible thing, had on you? Okay, I was 21 years old, and I was an intern. I met some interns here for your magazine, and I feel great kinship for them. <laughs> Although I have to say, at the Post, we got $145 a week, which is better than either one of us pay our interns. And um, no. me, me too, me too, <laughs> and. I, I, I wrote a bunch of stories for the post-style section, including a coverage of the Miss America contest, which was won, by the way, by Miss Arkansas in that year in 1982. A woman who apparently, well, OK. Yes, you all know. So. Okay. And in my, what, what do you do when you're 21 or 22 and you're not a genius? You show off. And at some point in this endlessly long descriptive piece about the Miss America contest in Atlantic City, New Jersey, a very great town, by the way, um, I 
was writing about Miss So and So, and you know, you know that phrase in Miss America talk, I'm now going to do my talent. I love that. I'm going to I'm now gonna do my talent. And her talent was some stupid dance. She was gonna, I don't know, dance to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or whatever it was. <laughs> And I, I wrote da 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 da, and she danced her hips akimbo. <laughs> Fine. That was the last piece. The post said, "Look, the Washington Star is folding. There's no job for you here. Get lost." <laughs> so I got a job teaching English to Japanese kids at Sophia University in Tokyo, which was like being Bill Murray in Stripes, right? <laughs> rice, slice, rice, slice, rice. I was the worst English teacher ever. And they never went to class because in Tokyo, I discovered, they work really hard in high school. And they never show up for class in college because they know they're going to go to this business firm or not, depending on what university you're at. And so I'm sitting there. I'm the loneliest Jew in Japan. <laughs> I mean, I'm at a Jesuit university. <laughs> Don't speak a word of, Eng uh, of Japanese. My roommate is, as he informed me, the racquetball champion of Tokyo, and that was the last words of English he spoke for six months. <laughs> I'm reading like three books a day. The, the priest said, as I walked off the plane, you may not date the students who were a year younger than me. So I was pr practically now a Jesuit myself. <laughs> and I got no mail from anyone, except one day I got 10 letters. And I opened them up. And there's a letter inside of each, each one. And a little slip of paper uniformly keeps falling out of each letter, like a, almost like a fortune cookie, a slip of paper in a fortune cookie. And it was a clip from the New Yorker. And it was a news break. And it said, block that metaphor. David Remnick in the Washington Post. We never use the name. But in that case, they use the name. David Remnick in the Washington Post, da 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 hips akimbo. So I was a jackass from coast to coast. <laughs> that was my first appearance in The New Yorker. All, all I ever wanted to do. <laughs> I had, you think I'm kidding. You know, I I'd had John McPhee was my teacher in college. I kind of, not only did I learn a lot of things about writing from him, but I also learned that maybe I want to write there someday. And so my first appearance is as a total horse's ass. And, and did it have any effect on you? <laughs> well, I mean, nothing that the use of antidepressants for six months. <laughs> no, I, I was embarrassed. But you know, um, if that's going to set you back as a writer, then then you shouldn't go into it in the first place, because a lot, you know, you're going to come up against a lot more. And it's it was it was not the best day. And I was happy to be in Japan instead of the United <laughs> States, because I could walk down the streets of Tokyo and nobody gave a damn. Because we had very few readers in Tokyo at that time. You, quote, never thought of being an editor, unquote. Uh, what did uh, Cy Newhouse say to you, uh, uh, a rookie, that made you think you could handle the deeply challenging job of running the Nothing. Nothing. Um, Cy Newhouse is a very quiet guy. And without betraying confidences and friendship, He's extremely quiet. He once told me the story that after he had hired Robert Gottlieb to become the editor of The New Yorker, replacing William Shawn, he then needed somebody to run Knopf. In those days, the Newhouse family owned the Random House Imperium, and Knopf was part of it. And he invited, at Gottlieb's suggestion, Sonny Maida, um, who was then in England, to come to America and interview for that job. Sonny Maida is famously quiet and removed and, and, and remote, unless you know him very well. And as Cy told me, he said, well, the two of us sat there for two hours, and neither one of us said a word. And then I said, would you like to become the editor of Knopf? <laughs> My job interview was similarly revealing, <laughs> in that Tina Brown quit. She, she, she went off to do something else on a, on a Wednesday and told everybody on a Wednesday, and there was no editor. And the next day, in the New York Post, a famously <laughs> reliable uh, newspaper. <laughs> there was like a horse race list, you know, like, like you'd see in the Daily Racing Forum, and it said, you know, Graydon Carter, four to one, who was then at Vanity Fair, and so and so, three to one. And then they stuck two writers on the bottom like a joke. And it said, David Remnick, 50 to one. <laughs> like I was a horse with a broken leg. <laughs>
And I thought this was very funny. And, I, and, and that day I went to work. I, was, I forget what piece I was writing. In my usual beautiful outfit, I was wearing like, the kind of khaki pants that you would wear to go clamming. <laughs> and a Leon Russell t-shirt that if you held it up to the light, it wouldn't do anything to the light. And I get a phone call saying, Mr. Newhouse would like to see you at the Condé Nast building, which was not then together with the New Yorker. So I go over to Madison Avenue. I'm, I'm, what does he want? Maybe he wants to talk to some writers. Is this your first encounter yeah. with him? Yeah, yes, yes. Never met him. In, I, if I met him, it was, and uh, that was it. <laughs> and we talked about the New Yorker, and he was pretty quiet, and, I, uh, and that was the end of the meeting. The next day, then it, believe me, I was interested in who was going to be the next editor. It was going to impinge on my life as a writer. The next day, I'm wearing the same pants, by the way, and a similarly beautiful t-shirt, and thinking I'm going to go in to do my work. It's now a Friday. And now I start talking a little bit more concretely. And I, I don't know. I, I said, well, maybe I'll write, how about if I write you a memo over the weekend about the New Yorker? And you know, if you're interested in to talk. And anyway, so over the weekend, he offered the job to somebody else, uh, a, a, a wonderful editor who had done great things for Harper's and, the, and famously for the New Republic in the 80s, named Michael Kinsley. That was on a Saturday, and apparently on a Sunday that came a cropper for whatever reason. Reasons, personal, financial, whatever, it fell apart. I had no idea, and yet I was the only one in New York who had no idea, because Kinsley had sent out an email to 3,000 of his best friends describing <laughs> precisely what had happened. And I woke up Monday morning, this time, I dressed a little better, because I'm not a complete schmuck. <laughs> and I went to work, and I had no idea if he read this memo. I didn't know what happened, and maybe they'll be smart enough to get you know, somebody who's actually with some experience. And I got, please come see Mr. Newhouse at the Condé Nast building. He said, would you like to be the editor of The New Yorker? And it, I, I don't know. I, I, I have to say, when Sarah Palin was being interviewed, <laughs> Last time around, and they asked her what makes her feel he could, she could, and she just, you have to, you have to go for it, you know? <laughs> I, I felt for Sarah in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's turned out better than the whole Sarah Palin situation. <laughs> and I, what can I say? That's, that's what happened. And in the beginning, as I say, it was very difficult. It was really difficult. You have to... You have to wake up in the morning. I think this would be true if somebody had been an editor for 20 years. Um, and imagine yourself that you are that thing because the magazine has to come out that week and decisions continue to roll in. I read the short story and I didn't like it. And, it's so, and I was reading a galley of uh, Philip Roth's novel, I Married a Communist. And I said to the fiction editor, why don't we do this? And the fiction editor snapped it to action. And I thought, this is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm making a, you know, a cartoon of this, and yet not. Yeah. What about the job did you never envision? What about the job surprised you completely? Well, I think when you, you all here think of what an editor does, you think mainly of a, uh, a man or a woman sitting at a, at a desk with a lot of paper or, or a laptop and, God willing, taking something that's good and making it a teeny bit better or making encouraging grunts and noises to a writer over the phone or <laughs> seated side by side. And that by, absolutely is, is, is a part of the thing. But the degree to which, remember, The New Yorker comes out every week. It's a commercial magazine that was losing money at the time, or so I was led to believe. And uh, I was telling you the story. I went into my first business meeting, and I saw an enormous number at the bottom of the profit and loss thing. And I thought, wow, it's great. The rumors aren't true. We're, we're, we're doing fantastically well. And I was about to, you know, chirp my optimistic and discovery to all these accountants and business types and in this room with a screen, you know, and a PowerPoint nonsense. 
And the publisher goes, mm. uh, I said, what, what, what? He said, there's a parenthesis around that big number. <laughs> you know what that means? Because I didn't. I had not a goddamn clue what that meant. So my business sophistication was limited. So that was one thing. And I think more seriously, the degree to which being the editor of a, of a magazine, especially with a, with a, a big staff of, 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 of complicated, driven, varying uh, people, all of whom have their desires, their opinions, their mishigas, translation difficulties, um, <laughs> and quirks. Um, that takes a lot of time and mental energy and learning how to be a human being and a helpful human being for you as opposed to you as opposed to you is not quite as complicated as being a parent, but it's not uncomplicated either. It's, and it's absolutely vital because people who are doing creative, honest, hard work need you. They need you to get them from, help them get from point A to point B because they are performing in public. They are putting their guts out there for public consumption. Their identity, their intelligence, their emotions, their rightness and wrongness, their politics, out there. Now, they're not coal miners. They're not risking their lives for the most part, though some do. But they need all kinds of different things from an editor, and you're never doing enough, and you're never doing, you're certainly not doing right by everybody all the time. Um, and you're, I wake up every morning concerned about that and go to bed every night concerned about that. Who have I missed? Who have I upset? Who needs more? Um, that, you know, and, and people, you know, they, they feel passionately about this work. Their attachment to the New Yorker may even be more passionate than one's attachment to an accounting firm, which is to say, you know, <laughs> they really, this is, they want to be at this place. They care not only about their thing, but the other thing. They care about the enterprise. They worry, now that we're in this very difficult period, uh, financially and technologically, they worry about its future. Yeah. So I need to be there for them in many, many, many different ways. And that was very hard to predict and know. And different people do it in a very different way. Harold Ross probably was not the softest shoulder to cry on. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I didn't know Harold Ross. I didn't know William Shawn either. Um, uh, Bob and Tina I know very pretty well. I hope uh, you all realize that we just heard one of the uh, most insightful explanations of uh, the usefulness of uh, an editor to us as a herd. Well, I, I, I'd say this, Mark. You know, John Updike was a, a gift to the magazine. It was like right. some... No, he was there for 50 years, 50 odd years. He wanted to be in the magazine. He needed us like a bull, yeah, et cetera. I mean, he didn't need us, but he loved being in the magazine. He loved seeing his, I mean, after 50 books, he loved seeing his name in print in supermarkets. And even when he was in his 70s and needed us even less and, you know, was still publishing a book a year and maybe even felt tired once in a while, we could always entice him through unbelievably passive-aggressive means. <laughs> so you call John and say, or, and especially his, his editor, Henry Finder, who's a kind of genius, Henry Finder is. So you know, there's this new uh, novel from Botswana or Burma or nobody's ever heard of it. And yet there's a little buzz about this. And I thought you'd be interested in reading it and maybe even writing a little essay about it. Oh, you know, very decorous. New England, and he never, never came into the office, maybe once a year. Right. And say, uh, oh, no, I couldn't, no. Nah. Send it along. <laughs> to FedEx it up to Beverly Farms in Massachusetts, north of Boston. Four days later, out of the fax machine, zzz, a perfectly formed essay that the degree of editing would be to take the same kind of thing that you do with something that has a little few erasure, you go and put it right in the magazine. <laughs> Same thing with fiction. You say, 
thought, John, we haven't had a short story from you in quite, quite some time. Well, you know, I'm working on this novel, and you guys have just tired me out because you made me review 17 new uh, novels from Argentina or something like that. <laughs> and Roger Angel, the fiction editor, or Deborah Treisman, or would say, oh, well, we just got a really good short story from Wells Tower. You say, Wells Tower, who's that? Well, he's a very good young fiction writer. I think he'd be interested. And you could feel his competitive <laughs> sack <laughs> rise. And four days later, there'd be an exquisite story coming out of the fax machine. Now, he was a freak. Yeah. John Updike, and I say this with, with love and, 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 and mourning. Um, so uh, other, people, the, other people have to be cajoled, discovered, found out, pushed, pulled, not too hard, not too, you know, Different people need different things. And then there's the matter of the actual work itself. It should come to you as no surprise that not everybody's level of accomplishment uh, is absolutely uniform and, and, and perfect. And without destroying that person's sense of amour prop or, or, or self-regard, uh, you have to go at those weaknesses so they get stronger. A great editor cannot make a great piece. A great editor can make a good piece better, can make a very good piece push it toward greatness by certain means. Right. If the writer is good enough and the editor is good enough to hear each other and they're in concert, there is no way even the best editor makes a piece that's a C and A. That's just not going to happen. But you can certainly take something that's a bit of a dog's breakfast and make it serviceable. So let's say we get a young foreign correspondent whose great virtue is running around Sudan. And that person very bravely is in Sudan, and they've been writing for a wire service, and they're not used to the New Yorker, but their great virtue is they're there. They see something horrendous is happening, and we're glad to have it. If the piece is, is you know, as a, as, a, as a piece of writing, is, is, is a bit of a mess, you can get it to uh, there can, greater logic, uh, solecisms are removed, um, uh, arguments are, you can put pressure on the logic of an argument, but it's not going to come out sounding like, you know, John McPhee right. or James Baldwin or wh whoever it is that, that, that's in the same region. So editors are, uh, can be enormously helpful, but they can't, they, they, they don't, create genius. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I didn't, I, <clears throat> I didn't want to uh, say this, but well, I kind of love John Updike, and uh, he is... Uh, I know, he gave you pieces to run. Yeah, and he, he is an easy target for uh, um, uh, kids. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I, just just so you know, uh, he sort of uh, inspired the spirit of our little magazine because um, he's in your first issue. He's in our first issue, and uh, we I, I sent him a letter and asked him uh, if he had any um, funny poems that he might want to let us use. And he said, well, I have one, but you, you won't like it. It's right. really terrible. Right. It always comes with, it, it, it comes gift wrapped in apology. Yes. Yeah. And it was called the Beautiful Bell Movement. And it was. Yes, it's known around the office as the shit poem. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's, <laughs> it's wonderful. And, you know, it, it allowed, I, I, I hate to yeah. admit this, but um, this Yankee, allowed this Southern magazine to live because any writer with his eyes open would want to appear in a magazine that published, that had that poem in it. It was such a great poem that you would want to be associated with it. Yeah, I, th I think John, um, God knows he was rewarded and, 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 and highly regarded in many ways, but I think he also took a lot of guff because he wrote a lot. Right. And not only did he write a lot, all that he published in periodicals, got folded into these big collections, picked up pieces, right, and right. More, more matter, which is a kind of a joke right. about his own critical writing. Right. 
but there was a kind of fluency there that Americans are not used to. Brits are more used yeah, to it. Right. And you look at a writer like Chris Hitchens in, in, right. in the journalistic world. Chris, who's alas extremely sick, right. is even in his illness, is blessed of a fluency that the average American, even the very good American reviewer, does not have. He has it as, you know, he, he took that David Mamet political book, and I swear to God, it was like watching Zorro uh, <laughs> with six quick strokes across, you know, the enemy's um, uh, vest. The vest just fell off, yeah, right. and that was it. The emperor was naked. Um, what aspect of the New Yorker's editorial team are you most involved in and least involved in? Well, I'm not there for night foundry, which is to say there's a couple of people that stay up all night and check to make sure that the slightest little ligature mistakes or printing mistakes. But I, the rest of it, I'm, you know, up, I'm up to my elbows. Really? And, and the, 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 the levels at which, well, I read pieces when they come in. Sometimes they don't want me to read pieces right away. That's always a flare. Um, but I, I need to read these pieces and get my ore in pretty quick. Um, you know, on just basics. It doesn't make any sense. It's too long. This is terrible. We can't use it. It's absolutely wonderful. Move it up in the schedule. You know, just for general notions of what it is. Um, but I am by far I, way down the ladder on who the best editors in the house are when you're talking about this. Right. I mean, I, it's, it, it's pointless. And, Somebody like Daniel Zalewski is a kind, uh, genius is a cheap word, but a, a, an absolute master at helping writers in, narr in their quest to write ex exciting narratives. So a guy like David Graham, do you know David Graham, a kind of young-ish writer, came to us. He was a good magazine writer. I hired him from the New York Times Magazine, New Republic, and he wrote, he wrote good pieces. And I figured he'd do some pol political pieces and this, that, and the other. And somehow, working together with Zalewski, he went to a level, and I think his own sense of ambition changed. And I, I, I'm vain enough to think that the New Yorker, the New Yorker is a form of permission. Now, not just in length, but in, in, in ambition. The, right. the, the, the notion that you don't have to put all the good stuff in the first two paragraphs, yeah. and all kinds of things right. like that. And to say nothing of the collaborative aspect of it. So there's a guy like Zalewski or a guy like Finder or a woman like uh, Dorothy Wickenden. Um, Susan Morrison is excellent with Talk of the Town. Um, but there's also people whose names you probably won't know, like uh, even if you're, you're a New Yorker nut, like Ann Goldstein. Uh, and and uh, Updike worshipped her, who is, has a job. If she, when she fills out her tax form, if she's honest about it, she writes OKer. That's her job. She's an OKer. Which means she's like a super, she also has some writers to herself, but she, she also has this thing where she's reading things after the first editor. And the feeling of getting a proof back from her and then taking her corrections, you know that feeling you go to a good hotel and they make the bed in a way that you never can? <laughs> How do they do that? You know, you can't quite pull the sheets out, they're in so tight. And there's, you could be left alone with your bed the next morning for two hours, <laughs> and you couldn't do that. That's what Anne Goldstein does with the English language. She's able to find little pieces of schmutz and, 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 and illogic and um, fat and all kinds of little things, and by slowly scraping it away, it's like the difference between Crawfish etouffee in an OK place and crawfish etouffee in heaven. <laughs> and to have that as a writer behind you, and then Henry Finder reading it before you, and then these overeducated checkers who are working their asses off to make sure that you didn't, you know, misspell uh, anything or, or make horrendous errors of, 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 of all kinds, it's a very assuring thing. And then to, I Forgive me, but to then write somewhere else, you go, oh, my God. It, it's suddenly the earth is a little wobblier under right. your feet. And it's been a trick for us also online. Because of, to, to write blog posts, you, 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 if you're going to play the online game to some degree, you can't go through all that. Right. So you, you do feel the difference. 
both in terms of prose and the possibility of mistake. I'm not saying we publish a magazine that's utterly mistake free, but we try. We really try. How has being an editor <coughs> me, changed you? I have better shoes. Um, <laughs> in fact, I don't. I, I, well, look, being a writer is to be concerned with your thing, your one thing. There is, and I say this with love and, and, and even at times self-love, because I do do it sometimes, there is a singularity a, and even a kind of, um, narcissism is a negative word in this sense, but a, a, a blinkered view. You don't have to worry, you have to worry about life and all its contingencies, but in terms of your work, you are focused on a thing. Now, it may have branches and sources and all kinds of problems, but I, I know from talking to novelists, they're living, they don't just, they're not writing a novel, they're living in the novel while they're writing it. They'll go to dinner that night and they're still hearing the dialogue and they're still working it out. A novel is a problem. Philip Roth says, a novel is the problem and I'm the, you know, it, it's like living in an emergency room and I'm a doctor. And the assuring thing to him is that he knows what he's doing at this point. Right. He no longer has to write 200 pages to get to start. He knows what he's doing. He's been at it. And to be an editor is to be concerned with myriad things. Right. And I don't just mean the higher things, the, the prose things. Um, it, it has to do with ideas. It has to do with planning. It has to do with taste, uh, adventure, all the myriad things that can be brought, and people, and yes, business, and the business. So it's, 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 it's much more um, uh, less focused in a certain way. Can you be totally honest with writers? I've been trying. <laughs> Pardon me? I've been trying. You mean with you or with writers? No, can you be totally honest with writers um, or must you tone down what you think? I think it's important. Being discouraging is an act of narcissism on the part of an editor. To strut, to dismiss, to mock, it's an act of, you know, I think short-sighted stupidity and, and narcissism. There's no doubt, look, let's, let's face it, sometimes you get a piece and it's no damn good. We're not yet. The ho you, but an editor that doesn't live with constant hope, with the, some sense of the not yet, is a, is, is a bad editor, is a bad editor. Look, we kill things. Some things just don't work out. And that is no fun for a writer. And with one, only one exception I can think of, I, I, you know, I, I think, uh, those relationships haven't come total a cropper. You know, one, one writer who publicly was very angry at me and things didn't work out at the New Yorker, I, you know, I'm sorry. I, it, it is a, it's very painful. Right. And I would never um, go at it with that person or any, any person because it's painful. Right. Um, and I wish that person or any person where, where it doesn't work out or a piece doesn't work out really well. How can I otherwise? Uh, and I'm sure, you know, I'm going to make mistakes with people along the way of tone or emphasis or I'm too peremptory. And I worry about that all the time. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not blind to the fact I have some, look, we're all something. We're all somebody and, and not just a cartoon, but we, you know, um, I'm sure it works against me or at least it did in the beginning that I'm seen as a writer who writes quickly. So writers who have a problem writing in terms of volume probably thought I could never understand them. Um, you know, being a writer at the magazine where you're an editor, I, it probably cuts both ways. I, I, I readily see that. I didn't say well, I said quickly. Have you ever made a big mistake? as editor of the New Yorker? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how can um, 
I mean, I, I, how can you not? You, 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 you're, 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 we publish 46 issues a year. I wish we published 52. Um, William Sean used to carry around in his pocket or wallet. I think you've seen, I bet you've seen the photograph. I think we're the only two people in the world who've read every single New Yorker book. Um, I, I, and there are a lot of them. There are a few dozen. There, it's, 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 a, it's a sickness, let's face it. <laughs> and, but there's a photograph taken of a, of a little list that Sean carried around in his wallet. And um, when I was a kid, when I first started traveling, I'd write down every city I'd ever been in, in the world. And it just made me feel worldly. You know, it's like Stephen Dedalus writing the list of where he is in the universe. And Sean used to carry around lists of ideal issues of the New Yorker. You know, um, I, I don't know, James Thurber, uh, humor piece, uh, short story by Rebecca West, uh, James Baldwin nonfiction piece, followed up swiftly by a John Updike baseball, you know, et cetera. And e anything short of that, if you're really tough on yourself, is a disappointment, right. a, fallen, a little bit of a fallen universe. Right which is unbelievably unfair to everyone. Um, but, you know, sometimes you publish things that were, I don't know, I, I, there was a piece that Robert, if you want an example, or you're being too polite to ask, you want an example? Sure. I don't think this was an especially egregious thing, but I remember Robert Wright, who's a wonderful writer about science and religion, he wrote a piece on, on Stephen Jay Gould that, Steve, that really upset Stephen Jay Gould. And there were people that had a point about whether it was too tough or not too tough. I, I, I don't know. But I, in retrospect, I look back on that and I wonder, I wonder how Bob feels about it. I don't know. Uh, I don't mean to be unfair to him. I probably shouldn't even talk about specifics publicly. But um, I know what the public thinks I made a mistake about um, a couple of summers ago, three summers ago. And that was a cover about Barack Obama. And I don't think that was a mistake at all. No, it and I'll tell you, you want to talk about it? We can talk about it. Um, you've heard, but you've heard my explanations. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, the it, public it, speaks. <laughs> but but, but let, let the cover speak for itself. I mean, it, it well, that was the problem with the cover. The fact that I had to go on television, and I did have to because there was a, a shitstorm about it. And, and, and then to be on with Wolf Blitzer and be called, I swear to God, a Nazi. Uh, Wolf Blitzer. He called you a Nazi? Well, he meant it, he meant it with all due respect. <laughs> <laughs> I've always loved that. The Sopranos is the one place I got this right. I'm from New Jersey, so I, anytime somebody begins a sentence with all due respect, means somebody's going to take your head off. With all due respect, you suck. Um, uh, yes, he said this, this well, I'll, for a little background for those of you who are not, don't have absolutely perfect 2020 memories, there was a cover in the political season after Obama had edged out, uh, thank you, had edged out um, Hillary Clinton and b before the conventions, and, and, and polls were showing that a huge portion of the country still believed that Obama was a radical, and Michelle was, you know, one step away from being Angela Davis, and by the way, he's from Kenya and Muslim, as if there's anything wrong with that, and by the way, he might be a terrorist, <laughs> and he's palling around with terrorists. By the way, I didn't make this up. A vice presidential candidate said it, et cetera. And then he wasn't a patriot. He didn't love America as much. And Barry Blitt, who, I, who was our most political cover artist, and a, I, I think an incredible phenomenon, put all these images together in one image and, at, and to, to make it as ridiculous as it patently was and is. And I think, and, and it caused an, a real uproar, not least because Obama's people themselves, who were awaiting a piece from Ryan Lizza about Obama's life in Chicago, and they were very on tenterhooks about this in the same issue, saw the cover and lost it. Yeah. And I think they lost it, forgive me, sanctimoniously. Yeah. And I think they knew damn well what it meant. Obama is one of the biggest New Yorker readers imaginable. 
I mean, he passes, he's passed around to Tul Gawande pieces in the, in, the, in the White House. I know this. Well, I wrote a biography of him. I know him. <laughs> I know in David Axelrod's office, there's a giant New Yorker cover poster. So uh, it, it, was, it was a little bit disingenuous. Even like cover, do you? What? Well, 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 what was his but I must say, cover? but then I proceeded to get a bazillion, approximately, a bazillion <laughs> emails and letters by people who were really angry. And most of them were people who were Obama supporters. By the way, previous to that, we had published 900 anti-Bush covers. <laughs> I must say, one better than the next. And, and, <laughs> and this wasn't meant to be anti-Obama, in a sense. But I, the letters almost uniformly and, and sincerely um, would come from you know, blue state areas, for the most part, and basically say, of course, we understand it. But those people out there, <laughs> and in those other flat states that look a bit square, they won't understand it, and it'll make them more racist or et cetera. How do you go about answering that? I thought that was illogical. But you know, uh, it, it's hard to, when you are when you're in a position when you're explaining a joke on television, that's not an ideal position to be in. <laughs> I, I, and I don't mind being called a Nazi. You know, I cover Israeli <laughs> politics. Everybody calls each other a Nazi. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they mean it with all due respect. <laughs> Stop it, David. The only thing that uh, uh, triggers a little uh, uh, click in my head is uh, what was Obama's response to the cover? I, I wasn't Obama farmed it out. Obama let a spokesman say, we didn't, you know, like the queen, we are not amused. Um, it was a bit of, um, we didn't think it was constructive. I mean, it was, it was, and then Obama was asked a couple of days later, he didn't think it was funny, but, but, but. You, know, you could see he was not, he, this is not, he, he, it was a distraction. Look, if you're in a political race. You're running for president or anything else. You are inside a bubble, and you are in a, in a kind of war mentality. Right. You remember the War Room, the Clinton movie? Right. You know, it's us against the world. Right. And anything that might play negatively or have a negative, right. well, you know what? I'm not publishing The New Yorker for Barack yeah. Obama. Yeah. I'm not. Right. And, um, and I, you know, the fact that, and, and if you are an editor and nobody's ever mad at you, you're, you're not doing yeah. your job. Yeah, I, thought I didn't look, the, the Pentagon didn't exactly appreciate the Abu Ghraib stories by Cy Hirsch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> too bad. And, but that's easy for me to say. That's righteous of me to say. I, I, you know, that, that you expect. This somehow satire, Art Spiegelman experienced this all the time and enjoyed it. Um, but ba I, Barry did not enjoy it. <laughs> Barry did not enjoy it. It, it was very tough. It is not, e it, look, it is painful. Look, the, the, the longest running, most painful narrative in our country is the narrative of race. Mm -hmm. And to be called racist is, is painful. Right. And you may protest it, but when you're in that position, it is painful. Yeah. And I've written, I, you know, I'm a white guy. I can, oh, wow, well, I wrote a book about Muhammad Ali. He really likes me. That, no, 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 no. Right. You're in a bad position. Right. It was not fun. Um, <laughs> my uh, an assistant of mine, who, um, wonderful woman um, from the islands and then grew up in Birmingham, who's black, you know, she was, she was really upset. She, and she's not, really? and she said, look, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not a controversialist. I don't live in that. You know, it, it upset her. Not the, it, the situation upset her. And, um, but you know, that's a, it's a tough price. Our sales? Well, uh, believe me, sir, I, I, we, they did sell a lot, but we also got canceled subscriptions, or people said, please cancel my subscription, and my feeling is, you do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I promise you, promise you, and you believe what you will, I don't publish for sales. Yeah, so Do I want the magazine to sell a lot? No, no, no. I, I know you're at, just, you're just asking. Yes, it did sell because it became a thing. And I thought the Jon Stewart reaction to this whole thing was the best. And I will therefore be grateful to him for the yeah, end of his. 
Um, as they say, I'll send you the link. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said that the New Yorker has a, quote, very serious market, unquote, for what we are giving Bill Sir. Depth, humor, and if I may add, <coughs> beauty, unquote. Yeah, it's hard to use words like that. Beauty. I know that you are proud of your old newspaper days and habits but I've never heard an ex-newspaper man <laughs> use the word beauty in a sentence. In well, what ways do you give your audience beauty? Well, I, I think in, I hope in many ways. I, you know, um, I think there are writers in this room who, who've written fiction for us, and I, I, I pray that our readers found beauty in those. Um, I think when uh, Philip Gurevich is writing about Rwanda. There's a terrible beauty in that kind of journalism. Uh, or in, I think there's a certain kind of beauty even in humor. Um, uh, Richard Avedon, who introduced photography to the New Yorker, uh, thanks to Tina's, uh, I think, real contribution, or one of them. Uh, those portraits were uh, extraordinarily beautiful and funny and strange and all those things. I, I have no sense of embarrassment about it. I'm, I, look, I think this way generally about the situation. There's more media everywhere. There are more television channels. There are more, web, more and more and more websites. And there are more as, there's more everything. And I don't even think that's bad. I think a, a ton about what's happened is either extremely useful or potentially useful or even beautiful. But where depth is concerned, where ambition is concerned, where the highest values of accuracy are concerned and language are concerned, in a culture of rapidity and speed, I don't think there are more. I think there are fewer places because they're hard to do. They're expensive to do. Um, and I have many thoughts about the New Yorker going forward in terms of its place in modernity and technology and so on. But I will not give up, I can't give up, and I refuse to give up any of those basic values of what the thing itself is. Otherwise, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I think what we do is very much worth it. I don't think every issue is perfect. I don't even think every issue is terrific or even good. But the values of what we're talking about are, I hope, instilled in everybody who walks through the door. Um, again, I, we are treading the line of self-righteousness in every remark I'm making here. And I, I, I sort of apologize for it, but I, I don't. Um, because the reverse is worse. And by the way, I don't think we're alone. I think there are magazines out there, your own and I, I think there are a lot of places that put certain values uh, on, a, on a right and front and center, and they try to do great things. Yes, they don't do, it's not the same. I think, you know, uh, you know, I think what Bob Silvers does at the New York Review of Books, I think the New York Times, I think there, are very, there are smaller places, there are websites that have real cores to them, and I admire them. And I even, I even, you know, a well-fashioned thing that's, that's not serious is, is, is attractive to, to me. Well, you know. and, and you're exactly right. And, but, but New York is, <coughs> is the leader. It has one million readers. And it's got one million subscribers. I bet we have more readers. Okay. One million subscribers. Damn. And um, you are the, the leader of the movement for truth and accuracy and fair-mindedness. I'd say a leader. I, a I, leader. Again, I, I really, look, do I, when I go home and I close, do I think we're the leader? And I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no. I mean, I, I, think, I think, you know, to, to take a name out of the hat, I, I think Jim Bennett at the, the Atlantic and is doing the, you know, what he's trying to do the best he can. I think he has no, real I values or, 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 or a bunch of other places, too. And I too. agree, and th there are others, but, but, you know, there's a pack thank God, and then there happens to be a leader. And, no, I appreciate um, you saying it, that. It's, it's the New Yorker. 
Um, um, but I wonder, well, let me put it this way. Um, shoot, David. Uh, what did I do? What, what didn't you do? Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'm going to stop myself. How, how are articles accepted in the magazine? Do, do you uh, do other editors uh, accept articles? Do you, do other editors accept articles, or do you give them the autonomy to make those exceptions? No, I've got to pass on it. I've got to pass on it. But uh, uh, we have a lot Everything? of Everything? Yeah. I pick the cartoons. Um, I'm really strict about that. I mean, we have a cartoon editor, and he takes what, what's called the roughs. People send in maybe 10 a week, some of these people. Then he narrows it down and brings in maybe two from each person. And then we sit together, and, and I, I'm the, we literally have three baskets, yes, maybe, and no. And it's really high tech at the New Yorker. And, <laughs> and I choose I, somewhere between 15 and 20 a week, so that there's enough to cartoon the issue. I knew you'd love that. But I, I, we're a small place, finally, right? We're only publishing a dozen things a week. Um, I think Henry Finder, in picking books that he once reviewed, very, it's not entirely true. Sometimes I say, Henry, why are we reviewing the, um, the Slovenian um, poetry collection? He'll say, well, you know, I, and Henry kind of mumbles something. He'll say, well, it's very interesting. But on things where we're assigning people to go places and fill their notebooks and you know, uh, yes, I do pass on those. But the input from writers and other editors is intense. I'm not sitting there at a desk saying, we must have this, 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 and this, and then assign it, and then everybody else is a copy editor. That's okay. in, intellectually, there are people at the magazine who know lots of things that I don't know, whether it's about science or economics or any number of other things then their input is absolutely vital, and I, tr and I trust them. And, that, and even more so, the same is true for writers for their own writing lives. Writers are, first and foremost, free to say no. I don't want to do that. That sounds boring. It sounds, I don't, I don't want to do it. That's number one. Basically, ideas become pieces of writing through a conversation. And it, it, the writer may say, I really think I want to do A, and A, in my mind, sounds hideous. Um, what about B? And B makes the writer think of C. So it's a, it's a conversation. There are certain writers who are un, you cannot, suggesting to them is not, it doesn't really work. Right? I, 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 I don't call John McPhee and say, you know, I have a 10,000 word piece on lacrosse. How would I possibly think of that? <laughs> um, it just kind of happens. Uh, some people really thrive on being said, well, what about you know, a political correspondent you know, like Ryan Lizza? We, we need to do Michelle Bachman. As we certainly do. Yes, it's the reality. <laughs> Live with it. What is the fairest and most insightful criticism you've ever heard about the New Yorker? Give me a for instance. No, please, you give me. I one. think I. <laughs> I. I think that there are. I, I'm a, as, as you could see by answers before, I'm a little anxious about New Yorker sanctimony. And one, a, a, a properly skeptical listener out there could say, are you kidding? We've heard nothing but New Yorker sanctimony from Remnick from the last hour about checking and his vaunted editor. Yes, it's a difference, but there's a difference between pride and sanctimony. Right. And there's a difference between honesty and being twee. Right. right? I, 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 I fear at a certain point, a magazine can have certain um, errant, errant directions. Okay. And, it, and the miracle of the New Yorker is not that it was good once, but it's, been, it's, it's had various periods where it's been excellent. That's a, high, that's a big exception in, 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 in the history of American magazines. Look at Life magazine. Life magazine, for older people in this room, you remember that there was no American popular culture without Life magazine. That was, the, that was the center of popular imagery in America from 1920 
from the war to Vietnam, say. That was its period. It kind of lived on a long time, but it, it really didn't matter at all. The Paris Review, in a smaller, at more academic or, or more intellectual, it never sold more than 5,000 copies, but it, it's, it's, its importance in American culture and in American intellectual life was the period when American, the anti-communist left argument was at its zenith. Uh, and you had writers like, well, you know all the writers in Paris and Review, Paris and Review, but then it lived another 30 odd years and it really was, it was just another small magazine that didn't have much vitality. It had some good things, but it wasn't central. To me, that as a, not just as an insider, but as an outsider, as a reader looking at the magazine historically, there have been periods of the New Yorker where it's been outstanding any number of times. Right. That's unusual, um, I, I think. Um, I, I would say in the 80s that there, were, there was the sense of it being more admired than read. Right. That even right. while there were some great things, that it had reached, uh, in some readers' eyes, a mannerist period. Um, uh, maybe a little bit too removed from the rough and tumble of life. And there that's were, why Brown should be given credit. And for I think Tina, you know, um, went in and injected a lot of life and currency right. in the magazine. For some readers, it was too much. Right. For some readers, it was vulgar. Right. Um, you know, I hear the word vulgarity and reach for my pistol, as Stalin didn't say, but um, uh, okay. And that vulgarity, by the way, is, it was part of the vitality, yeah. I, I think, of that jump start. Yeah. Not all of it was perfect. I yeah. think magazines live in the moment. They are, right. they are for, sometimes for the agents, but mainly they're for that week. Right. It's a weekly. It is a weekly. Earl Weaver, the great manager of the Orioles, you know the story. So, no, I don't. so a young player struck out, and he came into the dugout, and he kicked the water cooler, and he threw the bats around, and you know had a complete temper tantrum, and it was April. And Earl Weaver said to the player, he said, "Kid, you know we play this game every day." <laughs> that may or may not have occurred. I I just thought of it. <laughs> We call that in journalism, too good to check. <laughs> too good to check. Too good to check. The, the New Yorker's first two editors were famous for maintaining a separation of church and state, i.e. the editorial department and the business department were not permitted to share an elevator, let alone <laughs> mingle, let alone fondle. There was very little fondling. Very. It's constant fondling now. No winking. Harold Ross didn't want the editorial team conscious, unquote, of business matters. What part of the business side of I the hate, New Yorker do you I think I in? think this is this is the kind of thing I was talking about. I think this is this is New Yorker mythology and tw it's a bit twee. Yeah. And, and I know, I know, and I'll, let me and let me tell you, the New Yorker was always a commercial magazine. Right. Harold Ross was not a kind of airy intellectual. Harold Ross was a Western newspaper man right. who earned his, you know, his his stripes literally at Stars and Stripes. Right. He he made a cartoon of himself as a famous vulgarian, yeah. writing in the margin uh, 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 of a manuscript about Moby Dick, saying, "Is that the man or the whale?" Now, I think part of this was put on and part of it was real. Part of it, that's what got him through the day. And famously, at, a, at, a, at a, a party, an anniversary, I think of the 50th anniversary of the New Yorker, at, the, at, at a big hotel, uh, Plaza Hotel, something like that, there was a big thing of shrimp, and then there was another big thing of shrimp, one for the business side and one for the editor. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. It, this, the, if you, the, the idea that the New Yorker wasn't a commercial magazine, despite all its incredible material that it published editorially, if you pick up an issue in 1965, you can you break your back. Right. There was more carriage trade ads, and, and there, of course there was an active business. There was a, and there's a sociological reason for it, because the people at a, of a certain uh, education or class or aspiration wanted to, that the New Yorker meant something to both have as well as to read. 
And advertisers knew it. And so did William Sean. He wasn't, you know, um, Jesus Christ. Um, close. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, you know, so yes, I talked to the publisher. Yes, we have a New Yorker festival that has both uh, artistic and journalistic and business reasons for being. Yes, uh, we have special issues that are not there by mistake. But you know, this is, this is what we do to exist in the world, to be healthy. And uh, the, the flip side of it is not to exist at all, or to be, you know, or, or look, you, or you can be underwritten by a foundation like Harper's or by MacArthur, uh, or the way you exist. Right. But that's, that's not a kind of publication that's going to be able to come out every week, right. pay salaries, send people to Afghanistan and Iraq, and da 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 da. It's a, and, and pay fiction writers and, and, and cover artists and, and have people earn a living from that enterprise. So it's a different way of being. But, um, but I, it, it, on the other hand, on, it, let me finish. I, I don't, writers are not, I have to say, I love the writers, of course, but their grasp of the details of the business of the New Yorker uh, is rudimentary. Basically, all they want to know is the following. Are we OK? Are we OK? And they have every right to know it. And they have every right to be concerned when things are more difficult and, and please when not, because they want to do their work. They, the, the, they know how fortunate they are, because I know how fortunate I am to be at an enterprise like that. Well, I have no earthly idea what made you so wise, Remnick, but, um, <laughs> but the question remains. I mean, the, the, there was. There was naivety and stupidity, perhaps, in, in Ross's um, uh, uh, idea to separate church and state. I mean, it was, maybe it was just metaphorical. I think it, it's part, it, and part real, too. And, and it just, I, I think, uh, look, people, people hear that and they think a thing that it's absolute and there's literal geographic separation. Um, people also have weird ideas about the New Yorker and they have, their own notions of what the New Yorker will or will not do. I remember I was at a fight. Um, I, I was covering the Mike Tyson, uh, Evander Holyfield, ear biting fight. I didn't know it was going to be quite as ear biting as it turned out to be. But I, <laughs> now to cover a fight properly in order to get access to the fighters, you got to go for a week at least right. because the fighters shut down a couple of days before the fight. So in order to get them in training and last bit training and hear them talk and talk to their handlers and stuff. You've got to go for a week. Now, I, I don't know if you've ever been to Las Vegas, but I, two days is enough. Yeah. And I'm hanging out in Las Vegas, and I'm eating lunch at some, some casino um, boat. And, um, and I've got on, on me a press credential. You've seen these kind of press bastards. It, and it's the size of a, it, it's kind of like the size of a dinner plate, this thing. <laughs> it's not very dignified, but I'm wearing it. And, and, and I'm sawing away at my whatever. And this woman comes up to me, and she says, um, who are you writing for? And very proudly, I say, the New Yorker. And she says, the New Yorker is covering a fight? They would never cover boxing. And which just told me this person, you know, my favorite nonfiction writer in the history of the New Yorker, certainly dead, is A.J. Liebling, who's one of his great subjects with the fights, the best, I think, the best sports book ever written is The Sweet Science, almost all of which was published in The New Yorker. So this notion that The New Yorker wouldn't, now, now Sean was anti-blood. Sean was, <laughs> he was squeamish. And I remember he, Sandy Fraser, Ian Fraser, you know this writer? Yeah. Wrote Great Plains and yeah. wonderful writer. And he's interested, to me strangely, in fishing. And he, he went to Sean and he said, um, Mr. Sean, you always call Mr. Sh only Mr. Sean. And Mr. Sean, I'd really like to write a piece about fishing. And Sean, very small and, and very whispery voice, said, oh, oh, we, we, we couldn't possibly do that. <laughs> and, and Sandy, you know, who spent most of his summer and spare time like it, you know, with a stick in the water all the time, people like what they like. And, um, <laughs> 
he said, well, Mr. Sean, why not? With all due respect. And he said, well, first, there's the hook. <laughs> and then there's the, and then he couldn't even complete the sentence. He was so repelled. That it, I, it was, Sandy said it was as if he was going to get sick right on the desk. Um, one time, John McPhee handed in a piece about a woman who, ate, who called Travels in Georgia, about a, a woman who went around and scooped up dead animals on the side of the road, and they ate them. You know, porcupines, whatever you have in Georgia. I don't know, animals. In Jersey, we just have dead dogs. And, and lots. Just the New Jersey turnpike is dead dogs from one end to the other. And, and there was a line in the McPhee manuscript um, talking about how Carol, whatever her name was, ate the eye of, um, of, of, some, of something. And, and, but McPhee was truly repulsed, not by the eye, but by the, uh, the fact that he had to eat a Pop-Tart for breakfast. And the, there was a rhetorical question in the manuscript. I don't know what was more repulsive, eating the eye or the Pop-Tart. And Sean, in his feathery, <laughs> in his feathery hand in, in the margin, wrote, not the Pop-Tart. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think Sean's, Sean's gnomic, genius public image may have tipped indicated to some readers that there was no blood in the New Yorker. But in fact, Sean's greatest achievement early on as a writer was the editing of the Second World War pieces that came in under Harold Ross. Um, so there's a difference in life between a cartoon of a thing right. and the reality. As a writer, have you ever had to work with a bad editor? editor? <coughs> And um, if so, what did you learn from the experience? Not to work with that bad editor again. <laughs> well, look, I, 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 at, the, at the Post, I, I had an editor who, who was probably not terribly interested in being an editor. And we, at the Post, we had a compu computer keyboard that was, these computers were made by Raytheon. They designed it for uh, the Post. And on, on, on the keyboard, there was a button that said, done, which is a wonderful thing to have as a writer, and even better <laughs> as, and it obviously passed it along down the line of editors. And I would hand in this piece, and this guy would then talk for about 15 minutes about his nine-second experience of covering the Civil Rights Movement. I, I, literally, I think he covered one march, and, but he'd go on and on, bloviate about this, and then he'd say, Great piece, and then he pressed the done button. Now, on the other hand, I also know as an editor, every initial conversation with a writer about a piece of writing that he or she has just handed in that does not contain the following language and limit itself to the following language. This is the greatest piece you have ever written since the last one. <laughs> Anything other than that is problematic. <laughs> And difficult and hard because writing is unbelievably hard to do well. It's hard enough to write a cogent postcard to your Aunt Minna. <laughs> Much harder is to take a whole lot of information. We're talking about nonfiction at the moment, but it can extend to anything and make sense of it and present it creatively, movingly, logically, clearly, elliptically, whatever it is the desired effects are and to get it right the first time from top to bottom. So any conversation is immediately fraught. And Dorothy Wickenden and I all, always talk of something called the editorial future tense. The email that begins, this is going to be a fantastic piece. <laughs> uh, look, they're tricks of the trade. The writers are on to it if they have 10 minutes of experience. But at least they, it's, it's like when you're dating and, and you flatter someone. It's not what you say, it's the effort is appreciated, <laughs> right? Um, no one believes you are the most beautiful one I've ever seen, but at least you've taken the trouble. <laughs> I'm, 
I'm gonna hop around here because my mind is growing and my head is uh, cracking <laughs> because of all of your uh, amazing words. But I'm, I've got to ask you a few other things because I've got you. Yeah. Um, you got them too. How are you feeling about that? You're all right? Okay. Do right. right. you mind a few more questions? No. Okay. So it's all on them. Um, well, Um, you, you've talked about how writers need uh, th these are going to be bounced around because uh, I just want to uh, have to ask yeah. you've talked about how writers need to quote earn the right to write in the first person I, I said that it. you said it I fact checked it well I think more I, I think some writers don't feel that that's the case I think some writers feel if, if you need it you just do it and I, I was reading a, 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 a manuscript that just came in from John McPhee, who seems to be accumulating pieces about writing, to write a book about. McPhee's been a teacher at Princeton for many, many years and teaching writing, and has thought a lot about these issues. And he is somewhat shy about using the first person, although he does. And I think his rule of the road is if you need it, you need it. But I would, he doesn't automatically reach for that pistol. You know, t Hunter Thompson didn't have any such hesitation, and he was, God knows, a successful, entertaining, and thrilling writer. There are no rules in this. It's right. what works. Right. It's what works on its own terms. So I, I, I have nothing more interesting that, about that, to, uh, nothing more interesting to say. So J Joan, um, Janet Malcolm, in, that, in the Paris Review interview that came out a couple of months ago, was really interesting about what the nature of an I is in a nonfiction piece of writing, and that she thinks of it as a character that she herself, she's a very self-aware writer, and very aware that the I presented, the Janet Malcolm presented in Iphigenia in Queens or Psychoanalysis or The Journalist and the Murder, that that too is a character. Now, that's a, that's a you know, th these are almost philosophical as well as an epistemological uh, 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 questions as well as art artistic ones. Um, but I think certainly fiction writers uh, spend a lot of time thinking about this. Um, uh, do I begin my novel with uh, <laughs> Call Me Ishmael or do I begin with a description of, of uh, the other character? That's, that those are big artistic decisions and have, you know, having to do with voice and self-presentation and, and projection. God knows a lot of the work of Philip Roth is about these very issues. But you used the verb earn. You said people had to earn a right. Well, that's pro I, th I, I have to say, I bet you I said that a long time ago, or maybe not, but it, 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 it's a very newspaper thing to say. Because in, 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 in old-fashioned newspaper, you would never, first of all, you weren't allowed to. All right. and, and if you did, it, it seemed like the ultimate in, 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 in self-fashioning and posturing and so on. Unless you were Jimmy Breslin, unless you were a columnist, okay. um, you were you were meant to be writing in the godly, omniscient voice, rather than the um, first person. In the famous first line of the journalist and the murderer, which uh, first appeared in the New Yorker, Janet Malcolm wrote, "Every journalist who is not too stupid or too full of himself." notice what is going on knows that what he does is morally indefensible. indefensible. Do you agree, Mr. Remnick, with Malcolm's thesis? I think it has limited um, sense. In other words, I think uh, that it's morally indefensible? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think it's morally indefensible. I think that there are moral quandaries. I, 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 you know, I, I don't mean to water down what Janet's saying. I think Janet, look, Janet is an extremely, Janet Malcolm is an extremely intelligent woman. And I think also she, in that act, is being a provocateur. And she's also self-aware of her own uh, past books and their reputation and, 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 and so on. I think, though, that if you write long enough and freely enough, you look back sometimes and you think what you may have written is either, can be, 
morally indefensible or not fair or too tricky by half. And also, if you have half a brain as, as a reporter and you can see yourself clearly, you know that you're romancing the stone a little bit. Look, I, I show up at Al Gore's front door, knock, 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 literally. Um, invited, by the way. But <laughs> although I've doorstepped any number of people, but doorstep meaning to show up. But I'm invited to come write about it. And, you know, there's a transaction going on. There's a transaction of what I want and what I need and what he wants and what he needs from this transaction. And I feel less bad about it when it's with an experienced person like Al Gore right. as opposed to a grieving mother. Right. Um, but I do think it, 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 you are, it, it's not about indefensibility, but you're, you are stupid if you think that there aren't moral questions and quandaries in these transactions. So you want me, I can be more specific. Okay. Um, you know, um, well, look, just for humor's sake, I, I took it. Stop a, being so funny. Is that a bad thing? I'm driving me nuts. Why is that? You want me to be somber and boring? <laughs> you want to you want to talk about wither the internet or something like that? Okay, all right. Okay. No, but I mean, you know, Bill Clinton takes a trip to Africa, and he schleps along a few reporters. And I'm on the plane, and we're going from Berlin to South Africa. And he comes in the middle cab, and he sits down to talk to the reporters. And we're told we're not allowed to take notes on the plane. Or the plane is off the record. OK. First of all, give me a break. The plane is off the record. He's the former president of the United States. But all right. And he sits down, and he starts doing his Clinton thing like, you're reading that book. That's the greatest book I've ever read. <laughs> and it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And he doesn't leave till 5 o'clock in the morning. He, I, I've never seen anything like it in my life. I'm gonna, now the thing about living off the grid on the electrical system, and these reporters are dying. <laughs> But they're all experienced. They think, to them, he, they don't want to hear. They don't want to, they've heard this 9,000 times. They've heard the full Clinton. I am all the ears. <laughs> and he's going, and then I, to, I, to, I told Dukakis, you're crazy to do that. <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm trying to memorize everything he's saying. <laughs> and I'm running to the bathroom as if I have like a horrible kidney problem and I'm writing things down. <laughs> And, but I'm not going to screw him. I'm not going to lie to him. I, I then go to the press. Can we put this on the record? Can we put this? No, negotiate. Da, 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 da. But, you know, is that immoral? It's the job. It's the work. You know, is Cy Hirsch getting on the phone with some guy and spending the first 20 minutes bullshitting him and acting friendly and then getting, extracting the thing he really wants midway through immoral? I think it has actually a high moral value. <laughs> so I think these are immensely complicated questions and situational. Sure. Have you ever lost? I have to say, it's a great thing to come to Arkansas and th somebody think your Clinton is not too terrible. <laughs> <laughs> have, you ever, uh, have you ever lost friends over things you've written or published or rejected? If so, have those? reactions caused you to do things differently? Yes and yes. And can you? No. <laughs> because? Because I think those transactions are, are, are editorial transactions, even if they're not painful or private, and writers have a right to, they can, they can talk about it elsewhere if they want, but I think, you know, uh, I don't think shrinks or doctors or lawyers or editors have a right to then go out and, you know, blab about it. Isn't what a lot of, uh, don't editors reject a lot? Yeah, they do. That's mostly what they do. I mean, we get, I don't know how many short stories a week, but it ain't one. <laughs> we get 
I, I wish Deborah was here. Deborah, Deborah Trees was here, but many dozens. I, I have no idea. And interns, you know, interns are reading the slush pile, and, and then they pass it up the line if there's the least bit of interest. And obviously, well-known reader writers, or even semi-well-known writers, or readers, or writers that were interested, whom we're interested in, are being read by real editors. But it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot of rejection. Yeah. And Beattie famously sent, I don't know, a couple dozen or three dozen short stories to Roger Angel, and he sent back, and to his everlasting credit, and to her everlasting patience. She, he sent back encouraging notes, but you know that's a long time. That's really hard, even if you are really young and have no right to expect automatic acceptance. Um, sure, I get yelled at once in a while, but more it's a kind of uh, silent disappointment. And I, but I feel it, and, uh, and not just abstractly, uh, which is why I want there to be fiction and nonfiction in a lot of other places that are healthy and have space, and because it's not good for us to be lonely. I want Harper's, I want Atlantic, I want you, I want a bunch of other places to be terrific. I want to pick them up a lot and say, damn, I wish I had had that. Because if I'm not, then the culture is poorer, and I, thankfully I do do that all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, fascinated by this subject because it, it, it takes a personal toll on, on one, or can. I mean, for example, uh, New Yorker never published William Faulkner. William, the New Yorker didn't publish a lot of things. Yeah. You know, in, in, look at American poetry. We were great on Elizabeth Bishop. Where was Wallace Stevens? Right. You know, uh, you could, there are tons of names like this. Right. We were fantastic on Donald Barthelme. Where was, I don't know, pick. A lot. Right. Robert Coover, I guess, until Leonard recently. Leonard O'Connor. Leonard O'Connor published where? Not in New York. At all? I don't, I, I, I don't know the absolute. I don't think you know, so. And finally, finally, what are you going to do? As Tony Soprano would say, what are you going to do? <laughs> you, you've, you've, and, and, and sometimes there are reasons for it. Robert Lowell wasn't sent. He was sending it all to the Kenyon Review and the New York Review of Books because he had a financial stake in it. Allen Ginsberg was married to the whole kind of City Lights uh, alternative press thing. And they, the New Yorker didn't publish Allen, Allen Ginsberg until the period of like Wales visitation, sort of middle period. You're not going to get everybody. You have to know that. And by the way, part of that defines the magazine. Right. If you look back at literary magazines like The Dial, they're defined by who they did publish, not who they didn't. You can't publish the whole culture. Right. So The Dial is, is defined by Eliot and Pound and, and, and so on, or, or, or all those, all those little teeny magazines. Um, you can never include everything that was any good. I guess, I guess the personal concern is that when you reject a piece, the recipient feels that you, you. How can they not? You feel like you are superior to them. <sighs> Which we, of course, are not. Right. But, but the transaction is, is power versus supplicant right. in, 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 some, in some way. And that's, that's, how can it be otherwise? Yeah. What are we going to do? Take yeah. a vote, a national vote? Yeah. I mean, I, it, it, it's, there's no other way to do it. Right. That's why a magazine's reputation over time is built upon its, its, its record of, of, of taste and ambition and all the rest, and what it did publish. Right. You know, Harper's uh, published Armies of the Night. Right. When I was growing up, the hot shit magazine for me wasn't The New Yorker, it was Esquire. Right. It was Gay Talese and Tom Wolfe and Sarah Davidson and that, that stuff was hot. Right. That was really great for whatever reason. Um, and that's why I say, you know, some magazines, you know, you, you're lucky if your history has peaks, any yeah. peaks at all, right. and then stays alive. Right. It can't possibly be nothing but zenith. Right. Um, But um, is and I, I almost didn't want to ask this, but um, I think we passed that barrier long ago. Yeah. So. <laughs> what about uh, how is um, the New Yorker? Can we rest assured that the New Yorker is alert to the best writers in the South? Uh, here's why I asked that. Now, give me a moment to. Go ahead. To, to, Go ahead. 
plead my case. I don't think we, we can rest assured that we're alert to the best riders anywhere okay, but with let complete me, let confidence. Let me, let me plead my case for yeah. Case. William Faulkner was uh, rejected by the New Yorker uh, continuously and everybody else. Flannery O'Connor. Did he have a bad agent or something? <laughs> I think he was just too crazy. Um, then uh, uh, it's not my fault. It's not your fault. <laughs> the the one piece that you all published in the, in the it wasn't your fault uh, by the late great Barry Hanna was a, uh, a a sort of anecdote about an ice storm. Mm. Uh, not. No, not, it was not his. Not at all close to his I best agree. work. I agree. I agree. But you and, know, and we never saw the crazy Barry Hanna, um, um, you know, with the grandma crawling on her elbows with pistols blazing in in pages of the New Yorker. So, uh, but obviously, obviously, you all have published great. Southern writers, but I, this is my one uh, token. It's fair enough. I, I think. I don't think it's because you got a bunch of Yankee, isolated Manhattan editors who can't hear other voices. Barry Hanna. Well, well I, I can't. You know, you'd have to ask Roger Angel. Okay, I, I Roger. whether or not what what the Barry Hanna history with the New Yorker is. I don't know. Okay. Take Richard Yates. Yeah. Now, Richard Yates could not be more of a almost parody of seemingly of a New Yorker writer, right? What's Richard Yates writing about? He's writing about East Coast, you know, Cheeverland. Right. And he never cracked the New Yorker until he was dead, and I published him, but that's easy. Publishing dead great writers is easy, right? right? And maybe the New Yorker felt it had John Cheever. And, you know, look, Robert Coates published dozens and dozens of short stories in The New Yorker. No one reads Robert Coates anymore. It just doesn't. We just, we just don't. No magazine is going to be perfectly alert to everything. Right. Now, we've published a lot of foreign fiction, African writers, who've, some of whom have come here are still there. Uh, Europe, we tried it mostly things in English, but some things in translation. New Yorker did not do that decades ago, with, certainly with any regularity. Its approach to the avant-garde at a certain point was focused almost solely, not completely, but solely on Donald Barthamy. That was their guy. Whereas Barry, Hanna, and, and, and you know, all those other writers and people, they were appearing in the New American Review and, 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 and so on. There are reasons. Philip Roth's first stuff uh, was both commentary and then The New Yorker, but I think there's a bigger problem with fiction. It's not this problem. The problem is that most fiction writers, or a lot of fiction writers, don't write short stories at all. That the culture tells them, the market tells them, there's nothing there for you. Nobody buys books of short stories except for in rare instances like Ray Carver or something that after the early book of promising short stories, the agent is immediately on them to write novels. And for us, publishing excerpts of novels is less satisfying than publishing a short story. Just as I remember when, when a classical music station in, in, in New York, um, WQXR used to do things like, and now we will hear the first five minutes of the second movement of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. That's not a very satisfying listening experience, as great as that five minutes is. So there are a lot of writers that we don't hear from very often because they don't write short fiction. Right. It's people like Alice Munro, Updike, Ford, um, and a very few others continue to make short stories, put short stories at the center of their writing lives in mid and late career. That's a bigger problem. I want to hear from a lot of writers, but I'm, get, I'm given novel excerpts every three years. They sort of work as a story, but they're not intended as a story right. any more than, uh, you know, the allegro part of the third movement is, 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 is the entire symphony. Am, am, am I mistaken, or is uh, book editing in a very placid state? 
not sure I'd use the word flaccid in this sense, but I, um, um, in the wake of the wiener. <laughs> but I, I, look, I think book publishing is in, a, has, is in a tough state. Book publishing in terms of sheer volume, it's just book after book after book comes in. They, ha they have long, long lists. The profit margins are terrible. The book publishing industry is in a state of complete uh, upheaval because of e-books and the internet and bookstores and Amazon, and they're, they're in a spot. And sometimes uh, it is not surprising that the first priority of a book editor, especially you know, the higher honchos, the more experienced ones, is not the this. So the, the, the era of the Bob Gottliebs and Jason Epsteins and Dan Frank and, 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 and some others is not entirely gone, but it's as they, the euphemism in the business world is challenged. Because they have to buy books. They have to go to lunch. They have to da 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 And by the way, I have to do a lot of that too. Not the same things, but I have a lot of other things I have to do. But the editors at The New Yorker are, uh, you know, some huge proportion of their time is taken up with pre pre precisely the activity that you're talking about. It's, it's, I think, harder in fairness to book publishing to devote 100% of your time to line by line, chapter by chapter editing. It's, it's, it's tough. Are we still a little sorry for that? No. I mean, no, on, on no. I'm just you're you're asking me. Uh, I'm giving you what they say call in journalism a situationer. I'm just presenting the situation as it right. is. There, I, there are enormous exceptions. I, I you know, right. I, I, I did a foolish, a fool's errand. I hadn't written a book in ten years. I decided to write this book about race and Barack Obama and civil rights movement, and, da, da, da. and it, it, it was a s close to six hundred page book that. I wrote in the course of uh, 13 or 14 months, reported and wrote while doing this job. I, I really would not recommend this to the kids at home. <laughs> and I would never dream of doing it again. But I was very lucky to not only have some of my colleagues at the New Yorker read it and read it very seriously, including the saint at Ann Goldstein, uh, but also to have Dan Frank at, do this book for me at Knopf, even though he's mostly at Pantheon. So I don't want to say they don't exist. I don't want to be dismissive um, uh, of, the, of the entire industry. But that's, that's where they are. And that's their, that's, look, I'm not responsible for them. I can only run the New Yorker. Well, I mean, th but that's why I think we should um, uh, aspire in, in the direction of the New Yorker with its fact checkers and editing. You, you invest in those departments versus the book publishers who invest in the promotions department, and I have no sympathy for them. Well, if, if, look, if, I, 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 want, I want to be clear, though. We promote the New Yorker. Um, but, yet, but you also have a fact-checking department. We do, and it's ex it is expensive, and, 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 it, and it's large. And, and thank God. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to argue with you, that's for sure. <laughs> so uh, in some ways, it seems why does uh, Cy Newhouse uh, allow this to continue? I mean, he, to me, he is sort of the uh, underrated American. I'm really glad you say that. I, 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 I'm really glad you say that. It is, it is, as hard as it is to feel sorry for any industry, it's probably a reluctant thing to praise, much less feel sorry for a, a, a multi-billionaire. Uh, but I have to say that my experience with Cy Newhouse has been sterling. And what does an editor want? An editor wants resources and independence. That's it. Those are the, that's the key, and somebody to talk to. And I'll, I'll, I've, I discovered this very quickly on the independence score. Um, very soon after I started, Cy Hirsch wrote a piece and generated by the two of us, and he went out and did this piece, and he accused everybody of everything. I mean, I, I, you know, the prime minister of Russia was taking bribes from Saddam Hussein and God knows what else. A lot of things bad. And the checkers worked on it and the lawyers and I worked on it and the editor. And, and I didn't know what to do. This was so early. I was a really inexperienced editor. I mean, a complete neophyte. 
And all I had as an example was Ben Bradley. Ben Bradley was the editor of the, of the, of the uh, sorry, is that me? Ben Bradley was the great editor of the Washington Post in Watergate years and in my childhood as a reporter there. And I had known from reading his memoir and Catherine Graham's memoir that they had something called the no surprises rule. If they're going to run something really hot, meaning dangerous or controversial, it was acknowledged that he would pick up the phone and say, Catherine, uh, we got these things called the Pentagon Papers or Woodward and Bernstein are about to accuse the president of oh, God knows what. You just, so, I, so I called up Cy Newhouse and I said, um, I, I, I think I was calling him Cy by then, and I said, you know, we have this piece and we accuse everybody of everything and, and the lawyers have been through it and I'm confident in it, but I just thought you should know. And I was expecting, you know, 27 questions. There's a long period of silence. And he said, that sounds very interesting. <laughs> and that was the last time I ever called him. And I send the pieces down to him on Friday because he's going to go away for the weekend. And he, and he loves owning the New Yorker. He loves the magazine. Now, I know his beginnings there were controversial with the end of Sean's career and, and all that stuff. I, I know that. I know it as well as anybody could who was not there. But in terms of resources, independence, uh, I, 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 God know, I have no idea what his politics are. I eat lunch with him every two weeks. And I don't care. Right. And he's figured out mine, and he doesn't care. I've, he's never said a boo to me about it. About that cover, I, nothing. Edie, the word for Edie, Edie comes to mind. You know, um, I, we're, we're ending now. <laughs> And I, I Speaking of bad publishers. Um, <laughs> I, I would just like to um, I, please uh, convey um, our thanks to Cy Newhouse. Please, next time you have I will a do that. With, I will do that. Him, that he um, has the uh, fortitude and vision to hire, to, to love the New Yorker and to hire David Remnick. I'll, I'll relay half that message. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I really do think that, you know, when, when, when I think of all the things I hate about America at times, when I'm, when I'm in my nasty mood, um, I can pick up an issue of the New Yorker and remember that there is still hope, that, that there is a way that we can use our, our minds and our ethics to uh, uh, better ourselves and you are not only the steward of, of, of that tradition, you are an explorer. And you have um, put your own personal touch into the mission. And if nobody else but you and me understand that, it's all right, I guess. But I think, I think there are a lot of people who understand that and who really, really respect and honor and are grateful for what you do. And I thank you so much for coming up here. Well, thank you. To I, I appreciate it. <laughs>